I wanted to create a full comprehensive guide to the Na'vi from Avatar. So I did. I made it. And you're watching it now. And before we begin, I think it's important to note that this is like the longest video I think I've ever made. So I divided it up into chapters, allowing you to scroll through and select certain parts like language, culture, anatomy, etc. So let's just dive into it, shall we? The Na'vi, or in their language, the people, are an indigenous population of humanoids living it up on the moon Pandora. Not to be confused with the planet Pandora from the Borderlands games or the moon Pandora from Star Wars. Pandora is one of 14 moons orbiting Polyphemus, a gas giant the size of Saturn, but resembling something like a Jupiter in terms of appearance and what it's made of. This puppy is located in the Alpha Centauri system, roughly 4.37 light years from Earth. 4.4 light years, if you want to be that guy. Pandora was actually inspired by a dream that James Cameron had when he was 19 years old in college. He had this dream about a grand forest that was bioluminescent. Getting so inspired by this dream, he decided to skip sleep and start sketching it out. So the original idea for the forest was to have this blue and purple color scheme to it. But James Cameron and his team decided to make the forest green to better ground you in his world. The majority of the continents on Pandora are covered by tropical rainforests. This is where a lot of the Na'vi live, thrive, procreate, etc. In fact, the Na'vi have been living here before human history even began. These jungles are similar to the tropical rainforest forest covering the Amazon basin on Earth, but like much bigger, obviously. Well, that's actually an outdated comparison, because by the time the humans landed on Pandora, the Amazon basin had already vanished because, you know, people. In this deleted scene from Avatar 2009, we are told that the currently endangered Bengal tiger had been extinct for over a hundred years. Humans ended up having to clone the tigers to bring the entire species back. In fact, the tigers are just one of many species the humans had to clone to bring back into existence because they destroyed the their natural habitats. The humans, or sky people, of Pandora are a reflection of how real-life humans are treating Earth, specifically with stuff like deforestation, pollution, for-profit wars, you know. At one point during this deleted scene, Dr. Grace Augustine picks up a copy of the Lorax while walking around the decommissioned school. The Lorax being a children's story about major corporations committing deforestation and showing a complete disregard for the environment, leading to large-scale ecological disasters because temporary profit. And when further looking into the inspiration behind the Na'vi, Cameron and friends claim that they're inspired by what's currently happening with indigenous cultures around the world, and what has happened to indigenous cultures historically during the colonial period. But we'll talk more about that in a second. Right now, I want to begin with how they created the Na'vi. No, not that. Well, no, well, at least not yet. I meant more like how they designed the characters and brought them to life using that good old groundbreaking CGI. The writer, director, and producer of Avatar, James Cameron, Cameron wrote the treatment for the script in the year 1995. In 95, Cameron was super stoked about making the film because at the time, other films like Jurassic Park came out, and they were really showing everyone that anything was possible using CGI. And Cameron clearly wanted to use more CGI in his films after working on The Abyss and Terminator. But at the time, Cameron was told that it was not possible to make the movie Avatar yet. He had to wait for the technology to get good enough to create the world that he wrote. So he decided to put the script in a drawer and forget about it. And then we got Titanic. So old 10 years later, James Cameron pushed to make the movie again. In 2005, Cameron wanted to do a proof of concept to show 20th Century Fox that they had the right tools for what they wanted to make, which was creating photographically real-looking humanoid characters. So James Cameron asked Fox if they wanted to hand over $10 million so he could develop that proof of concept. Instead of the alternative, which was greenlighting a film and giving him $200 million to start a project that they weren't sure they could finish. So $10 million, and two years later, they ended up creating this one and a half minute proof of concept that ended up looking something like this. And because this is the most beautiful thing that you or I have ever seen. Cameron and friends immediately got approved and were given a budget of around $237 million. Stan Winston Studio, Giant Studios, and Weta Digital and those companies made a lot of progress within those two years of working on the software, the infrastructure, and the technique. Cameron's production was the first to use image-based facial performance capture, using a single camera on a boom mounted to the actor's head to film their face during each scene, doing a better job of capturing their facial performance than anything else at the time, turning this proof of concept 
into this. Okay, let's get into Navi Physiology 101. Y'all ready for this? So after all that money and hard work, we got the Navi, the only known alien creature that closely resembles a human. Like humans, the Navi have two arms, two hands, two legs, two feet, a torso thingy, one head with hair, one mouth that has lips that match humans, one nose, two eyes, and two ears. The blood that flows through the Navi is even red like ours. But unlike the humans, the Navi only have four fingers on each hand, specifically three fingers and one thumb. The Navi have four toes on each foot. This space between their big toe and their index toe gives them an opposable big toe like a monkey. That opposable toe helps them grip onto things when climbing trees in the jungle or the vines of the Hallelujah Mountains. The eyes of the jungle clans are mainly yellow. Their eyes grow to be about four times the size of a human's and have evolved to allow more light in for nocturnal hunting, which is why in this scene from Avatar 2009, Neytiri is almost blinded by Jake's torch. Also, the Navi got no eyebrows. However, the muscles above their eyes move enough to help convey that emotion when needed. Their cat-like ears resemble the ears of a cat as they rotate to better hear their surroundings. They also have a flat nose that looks like the combination of the nose of a human and the nose of a cat. Like monkeys, their tails are used for balance and gripping onto things. From the neck down, the Navi appear to be completely hairless, revealing a lot of their skin, which is light blue with darker blue stripes in a pattern that's resembling the stripes of a Bengal tiger, the same kind of species that was said to have gone extinct because of humans in this deleted scene. Like every other living organism on Pandora, the Navi have some bioluminescent qualities that help illuminate the night, as these white bioluminescent dots cover their skin. Like right here on their face, these bioluminescent dots look like white glowing freckles. A full-sized adult male Navi can grow up to 10 feet tall, and it's around 9 feet tall for adult females. To give you a better perspective, with Earth gravity, the average weight of a female adult Navi is around 419 pounds, while the average weight of a male Navi is around 463 pounds, and the average weight of your mom definitely outweighs them both. Their bones are reinforced with a naturally occurring carbon fiber. I decay if that also applies for their teeth as well. And speaking of their teeth, their teeth are pretty similar to that of a human's, but with more pronounced canines. Kind of like these little puppies right here. Oh God. At the end of the Navi's hairline is their neural cue. This body part allows for the transfer of information to create Sahelu, also referred to as the bond. They use it to connect with an animal like the dire horse or a mountain banshee, also known as Pale or Ikran. When the bond is made, they can feel what the animal feels, and it allows the Navi to mentally communicate with the animal, like telling it where to go. Sahelu is also used during mating. So when Dr. Augustine tells Jake, Sully. Don't play with that, you'll go blind. Yeah. I've nothing to add to that. But while we're on the topic of creating life, the female Navi gets pregnant the same way that female humans get pregnant. And some of you out there may be like, oh, this unfinished CGI is so funny and stupid looking. But wait until you see the pure haunting wrath of the unfinished Navi baby. What? No! And just when he thought the Navi couldn't one-up the humans anymore, the Navi's lifespan is about 30% longer than a human's. When focusing on another clan, like the Mekkaina clan, we can see what is is essentially a subspecies of the Navi from Naring, as the Navi from the Metkayina clan and other oceanic clans have evolved to better fit their surroundings, those surroundings being ocean. For example, their skin has become more green or teal, and the Bengal tiger stripes change into something that more reflects the water, so they're becoming a little spotty. The color of their eyes can either be green or blue, and when looking right over here, you can see that their hands have become fin-like to help them move through the water, and that fin on their hand extends for most of their forearm. We haven't seen too many close-up shots of their entire bodies yet, but it's safe to assume that the rest of their bodies, like their legs and their tail, adapted in a similar way. But it may not be as noticeable as this. Speaking of our inevitable demise, let's talk about the religion. The Navi operate under the belief that all energy is borrowed, and that one day you have to give it back. They believe that every living thing has a soul, and that after death, their spirit goes with Ewa. Ewa is their deity, their goddess made up of all living things and all their knowledge. It's said that the Navi practice the three laws of Ewa. Those laws being, you shall not set stone upon stone, neither shall you use the turning wheel, nor use the metals of the ground. These words predate the legendary time of the first songs, and when the humans showed up, they unknowingly decided to break all three of these laws immediately. Building these huge buildings, aka placing a stone upon a stone, they used the turning wheel as in the construction and mining vehicles, and they mined the metals in the ground. 
around, seeking large amounts of unobtainium deposits. Oh yeah, Unobtainium, the most on-the-nose name for a mineral. Unobtainium is this ultra-rare, highly valuable superconducting compound that fuels Earth's economy in the year 2154, as each pound of unobtainium costs somewhere around 44 million US dollars back on Earth. These three laws are meant to keep the Navi and these hunter-gatherer tribes, as well as maintain the balance with all life in their ecosystem. By not breaking these laws, the Navi can remain to work in unison with their surroundings. Awa's main goal is to protect all life, which is why she sometimes intervenes in relations on Pandora by communicating with seeds from the sacred tree or sending every single animal to kill the humans. Normal quirky Awa stuff. Pandora has this network of energy that flows through the entire moon. There's this electrochemical communication happening between the roots of the trees, like the synapses between the neurons in your brain, turning the entire planet into basically one big brain or computer, depending on how you look at it. This is a global network connected by all the trees on Pandora. During this deleted scene of Jake Sully's dream hunt, he experiences a vision where you can visibly see the network connecting everything on the planet. The Navi use specified sacred locations to access this network, like the now destroyed Utraya Makri, or the Tree of Voices, a sacred site containing all the memories of the rainforest, including the memories of the Omatikaya clan. The Navi can access this so-called computer or network using Sahelu. Once connected to the tree, they can essentially upload and download data. The Navi from the Omatikaya clan would go to the Tree of Voices to essentially upload their thoughts or memories to Ewa. However, the Tree of Souls is their direct line to Ewa, the same way that the Tree of Voices is a direct line to the Omatikaya ancestors, making the Tree of Souls their most sacred place. I want to give you guys a quick geology lesson about Pandora, because that's what you're doing with your Tuesday now. So Pandora over here, this big space marble, is actually the fifth closest moon to the planet planet Polyphemus. So Polyphemus has a very strong gravitational influence over Pandora. Pandora's liquid iron core, combined with its close proximity to Polyphemus, causes their vast magnetic fields to overlap, specifically in a place like the Hallelujah Mountains, where the flux vortex makes it impossible for human navigation systems. It is no coincidence that the Tree of Souls is located at the center of that flux vortex. Yeah, some of the mountains are tethered to each other by naturally occurring vines, but the main thing that drives these mountains to do their floating thing is the magnetic fields paired with the properties of unobtainium, as each mountain contains deposits of unobtainium. The stone arches, referred to as the rings of stone, were shaped by the electromagnetic fields. 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth was once entirely molten, and Pandora went through a similar phase. The magnetic fields shaped the molten rock and formed the arches that you see right here. Then the arches were further shaped by the wind and erosion over time. But going back to that sweet sweet unobtainium. Humans use this little mineral right here in superluminal communications and production of computer hyperchips. The fact that we can use this mineral for hypercomputing explains how unobtainium is basically the foundation for Pandora's network, which is definitely why Awa's third law is don't use the metals from the ground. By the way, strong thunderstorms or strong winds in general can make the Hallelujah Mountains collide with each other. The Navi referred to these collisions as thundering rocks. I thought that was a pretty cool detail about their world. Using the network of the tree roots, Awa is able to transfer the consciousness of one body into another, but the individual has to pass through the eye of Awa and then return. When the Omitakaya were attempting to do this with Dr. Grace Augustine, she was too weak at the time, so she ended up passing and then staying with Awa. I remember earlier in the film, Grace said this. There is something really interesting going on in there biologically. I would die to get samples. And then when she was dying and getting brought to the Tree of Souls, her first words are, You need to take some samples. So I guess be careful what you wish for, especially after this conversation she had with the Colonel. Or what? Ranger Rick, you gonna shoot me? I can do that. Something he ends up doing, as in shooting Grace and causing her death. We have really only been exposed to the Omatikaya clan when observing the Na'vi in the year 2154, which is a shame, because other clans have differences in their traditions and cultures. And if I'm being super duper honest, I am really looking forward to seeing more of them. But in the meantime, what clans are the humans aware of? Let's start with a random one like the Omatikaya clan, also known as the Blue Flute clan, one of the more peaceful clans 
Mountains living in the rainforests of Pandora. Why are they referred to as the Blue Flute Clan? Well, that is a, just a great question. The Omatsikaya are more passionate about music than any other clan out there, and they also play one instrument in particular called the Blue Flute. Another clan of jungle dwellers would be the Taukami. This clan is made up of Navi who focus on plants, as they're made up of alchemists, normal chemists, and botanists. The Tipani are known for being the best warriors out there. They're kind of like the Spartans of Pandora, as they even make their own armor from these crab shells. The Keikunan live a little bit more dangerously, as their home is located on the edge of mountain cliffs, which is the primary reason as to why they've become the clan that's best at flying banshees. The first ever Navi banshee bond was made by a Navi from this clan. The Tairangi clan also lives on the edge of a cliff, but that cliff is overlooking the eastern sea. Banshee flying is a huge part of their culture as well. And a little fun fact about that, they invented banshee diving, which is, you know, temporarily taking the banshee into the ocean to catch their dinner. The Anyurai are the astronomers of Pandora, as they map out the sky and track the movements of the moons, planets, stars, etc. The Olongi occupy a section of Pandora's vast grasslands. Based on their location, their transportation is heavily reliant on the dire horse. When going on the hunt, or into battle, they go with the dire horse. No other questions asked. And then of course we have the Mekkaina, who are primarily located on the reefs of Pandora. When navigating through the water, the Mekkaina don't use dire horses, and they don't use banshees. Their main form of transportation would be an ilu. In the book The World of Avatar, a visual exploration that said that there are many clans spread across Pandora's diverse environments. From rainforests to deserts, icy tundras, and tropical reefs, each culture is shaped by its surroundings and has its own rich history of art, music, and mode of dress. The diversity is celebrated, but the Navi way still stands resolutely at the center of their shared experience. So other than religion, the biggest similarity the Navi clans have with one another would be their language. James Cameron hired Paul Frommer, a communications professor at the University of Southern California, as a linguistics consultant, so that Frommer could create the language of the Navi. In an interview with NPR, Frommer recalled that Cameron wanted a complete language, with a totally consistent sound system, morphology, and syntax, as well as the fact that he wanted it to sound good. He wanted it to be pleasant. He wanted it to be appealing to the audience. So then Frommer spent the next four years working on the language. Sam Worthington, who plays Jake Sully, is an Australian in real life. And when asked, as an Australian, how hard was it to work with the American accent and the Navi language elements, he responded with this. I have enough trouble with English, let alone Navi, so I found it extremely difficult. <laughs> I think they had the Navi on big boards for me to read, rather than me having to kind of memorize it all the time, so that was a bit of a cheat. And when Paul Frommer was asked, how hard is it to learn the Navi language in comparison to learning something like French or Spanish, he said that he was a little bit too close to it to give an accurate assumption, due to the fact that he created the language. The Navi across all of Pandora speak the same language. Even though there are different dialects between clans, the Navi never found it difficult to communicate with one another, no matter how far they've ventured out. It's suspected that all of the clans sharing the same religion and religious traditions prevents drastic changes to their language. Banshees giving the Navi a quick and easy mode of transportation is suspected to contribute to the lack of change as well, as most of the clans can stay in constant communication with one another. But I believe that the biggest reason for their global language staying so consistent over the years is because of the global network that's connecting everyone, allowing them to be in constant communication with each other and with their ancestors. One of their main greetings is I see you, meaning I understand you and accept you. I see you is accompanied by a gesture of them extending their hand from their forehead down towards the other person. When it comes to the nonverbal communication of the Navi, they don't nod to say yes and they don't shake their head to say no. And they definitely don't do handshakes. It's nice to meet you, sir. <laughs> Sign language is a huge aspect of their culture as well, coming in handy for things like hunting. The Navi commonly use both both sign language and spoken language at the same time. Like here when Neytiri tells Jake that he shouldn't be there. You should not be here. Like a dog or cat, their ears and tails are used to communicate a certain emotion. Like a cat, their ears lay flat if they're upset or angry. The Navi are so in sync with their surroundings and priorities that they don't even have a word for lie. They had to learn the meaning behind that word from us. Let's go further in depth with the Navi culture and way of life. In 2154, we observe the Omatikaya clan living in Naring, the great rainforest of Pandora, living in the largest and oldest tree in the forest called Home Tree. 
Tree. How old is Home Tree exactly? Well, it's about 20,000 years old and roughly 985 feet tall. It was so big that the clan was able to live in the natural hollows of the tree. So when we were hanging out at Home Tree, we got to experience a lot of the Omatikaya culture. But as I said before, different clans of the Na'vi have different traditions. Yet we know that when it comes to the Na'vi way, they remain the same. So some of the traditions and rituals practiced by the Omatikaya clan have a good chance of being practiced by other clans around Pandora. The Na'vi stay in these hunter-gatherer tribes, but the roles of the hunter or gatherer are not defined by gender, and each role is valued equally by the community. Each clan is equipped with one clan leader and one spiritual leader. The clan leader's job is pretty self-explanatory, but the spiritual leader is kind of like a shaman, as they interpret the will of Ewa. In 2154, before the Sky People attacked, A2 Khan was the clan leader and Mowat was the spiritual leader. From a young age, the Na'vi are given a task to create their own song chord. When going through that journey we call existing, they pick a shell, stone, a crystal, or some naturally occurring thing to represent a milestone in their life. The events represented could be a battle, a hunt, the death of a loved one, a marriage, or even an engagement, and so on. All of the objects on their song chord make up the person's life song. During this process, they use word selection, rhythm, and melody to create an actual song out of their life events. Each Navi understands the significance of every object on their best friend's or family's song chord, because when a Navi dies, their song chord is sung by those who are closest to them. There are about 300 members per clan, and they maintain those numbers without significantly increasing or decreasing. In their system, one life dies, and another is born. In the teachings of Ewa, everything is on the path of becoming something else. So death is widely accepted, and seen as a necessary means for change. Them funeral traditions vary depending on which clan you're part of. For example, the Oceanic clans place their dead on cliffs overlooking the water. In the Omatikai's case, they bury the dead among the tree roots, lining the body with flowers and placing a seed from the Tree of Souls on them, as it represents the Navi wanting the deceased to return to Ewa. Their soul goes to Ewa, and their body stays behind to become part of the people. This whole cycle and way of life has experienced little change in the past 12 million years. The Navi are built to form a neural link with the Dire Horses for ground travel and Mountain Banshees for air travel. The Dire Horse is the main form of ground transportation for the Navi, and are sometimes essential for hunting. The Dire Horses are kind of like our horses back on Earth, but with two extra legs. In fact, a lot of the animals on Pandora have an extra pair of legs. The Navi can form a neural link with basically any Dire Horse out there, but when flying a flying creature like the Banshee, those things will only pair up with one Navi for their entire life, making them pretty freaking monogamous. The Navi that flies with the Banshee is referred to as Taranyu, or Hunter. The Hunter and the Banshee must choose each other, during a ceremony where Ikran chooses violence, and the Hunter must tame the flying creature. Because if the Banshee and the Navi choose each other, the Banshee is gonna want to kill the Navi. Once the Navi subdues the Banshee and Sahelu is made, all the Navi has to do is seal the bond by taking the Banshee for the first flight immediately after forming the connection. A Navi is born twice. You know, once when they're born, and then the second time is during a ceremony called Dream Hunt, which is the final stage in a Navi transitioning from a child to an adult to earn their place among the people forever. Jake technically makes the journey from a child to an adult, beginning with his naive and reckless behavior on Pandora. Neytiri even claims, You're like a baby making noise, don't know what to do. Then he becomes an adult through Dream Hunt, and he is able to unify their moon. Navi, like the Omatikaya, don't wear any paint while hunting. They only apply paint while they're going into battle, or during this rite of passage. When Jake's on his way to form a bond with one of the Mountain Banshees, you can see that he has a Mountain Banshee symbol on his forehead. During the Dream Hunt process, the soon-to-be adult is painted with white ceremonial markings matching the look of the Tree of Souls. Oh yeah. Dream Hunt. Let's talk about the final stage of Dream Hunt, shall we? So there's like this 7 minute deleted scene showing the Dream Hunt ceremony, something I felt was really important that they left out of the final edit. It's a really trippy sequence and it takes a dark turn. During Dream Hunt, the leaders of the clan give the soon-to-be adult Navi two doses of venom. The spiritual leader has the Navi eat a glowing worm from Home Tree, and the clan leader brings over an arachnoid to stab the Navi in the neck and inject them with its poison, all while having someone fan smoke into the Navi's face. So if you can't already tell, 
It's a really good time. Both poisons mix together to create the perfect state for the Na'vi to have their vision from Awa. For example, Jake Sully's vision involved him seeing the neural network of Pandora, the Eye of Awa, him becoming Taruk Makto, and the destruction the Sky People would cause. After the poison fueled fever dream is over, the vision is communicated to the leaders, and the clan recreates the vision during a feast. For the Omatikaya, once you become an adult, you're able to make your bow from the wood of home tree, and then you gotta pair up with someone. Like the situation with the Banshee, once the Na'vi makes the Halu with someone else, they're bonded for life. It is customary to solidify this bond in a place like the Tree of Voices, where you can mate in front of Ewa. And now, let's focus on like the opposite of love. If there's disagreements within the clan, the Na'vi can challenge each other to a one-on-one -on -one fight. A proper challenge starts with the challenger saying, I challenge you. And then the other person replying, I accept. Each competitor is given a spear, and it's implied that they fight to the death, or at least till the other person yields. For hunting, the Na'vi primarily use bow and arrows and knives. Their blades are made from either crystal or the teeth of an animal. We know that the hunters from the Omatikaya clan make their bow from the wood of home tree, but the Na'vi warriors can add stuff to their bows, like banshee chin veins that make their bow more aerodynamic. The Na'vi hand and finger placement while aiming a bow is the inverse of how humans do it. I love how Zoe Saldana, who plays an Atiri, claim that after all of her Na'vi training, she can only aim her bow like a Na'vi when doing archery in real life. The Na'vi typically go hunting while riding a dire horse or banshee. They begin the hunt by screaming Sivako, translation being to rise to the challenge, motivating the Na'vi to do that very thing, as it reminds them to be brave and fearless. So what kind of food are we hunting slash gathering these days? Well, let's see, there's berries from the Celia fruit tree. Each flower on this tree is hoarding at most 100 berries. The last berry on the string of berries, the one that's inside the petals, is said to be the biggest and most delicious. Squid fruit looks pretty freaking tasty. And these are actually essential to the Navi's diet. You can even see Jake Sully consuming one right here. And right over here behind Jake Sully, right, you know, right in this corner, you can see the cannonball trees. This fruit is definitely less squishy than the squid fruit we just saw, as the cannonball fruit grows like a coconut, and it's usually required that you open it with a sharp object to get the fruit that's inside. And then there's the Panapura, a plant that collects water and creates healing drinks. After every kill the Navi make, they perform a prayer for the animal's contribution to Ewa, reciting, I see you, brother, and thank you. Your spirit goes with Ewa, your body stays behind, to become part of the people. But pretend like I said that in Navi. The Navi hunt hexapedes, which are basically the deer of Pandora. The hexapede is the first animal a Navi warrior kills to become an adult. The Navi also hunt sturm beasts, which are kind of like the buffalo of Pandora as they travel in herds and will stampede if something spooks them. The Na'vi definitely don't eat the Thanator. The Thanator, in the words of James Cameron, could eat a T-Rex and have an alien for dessert. This six-legged predator that makes all other Sigmas peanut butter and envious can run up to 40 miles per hour, detect prey from eight miles away, devour its prey with its razor-sharp teeth, and has armor-plated skin that can deflect bullets. So yeah, the Na'vi are definitely not eating the Thanator. The Na'vi only hunt and gather from their surroundings when they need to. When they kill an animal, they make sure that nothing goes to waste. Every kill matters, which is why Natiri was upset when having to kill a pack of viper wolves to save Jake, as Jake was not in tune with the forest and definitely disrupted the flow of things. The mining company on Pandora, RDA, helped develop the Avatar program that was led by Dr. Grace Augustine, who apparently went to Stanford just like the sci-fi legend Sigourney Weaver who plays Dr. Augustine. You're welcome for that very, very, uh, useless piece of information. Anyway, Dr. Grace Augustine wrote the book on Pandoran Botany. The Avatar program utilizes the cloning technology from Earth to combine the human's DNA with the DNA of a Na'vi, in order to create a body that is like the Na'vi, but also a little human. Avatar is being a blend of human DNA mixed with the DNA of a Na'vi, makes it so that the Avatars still have some human traits. For example, eyebrows are back on the market, and they have five fingers on each hand. Also, you can kiss the opposable big toes goodbye because the avatars got human feet. Until the user or driver accesses the avatar body, the avatar is just an empty vessel with nothing going on up there. Humans can't breathe on this foreign beautiful death trap we know as Pandora. This is due to the nitrogen oxygen atmosphere being much denser than ours and containing high amounts of carbon dioxide. It also has hydrogen sulfide erupting out of hundreds of volcanoes on the moon. So even though Pandora appears to be Earth-like, if a human 
someone is exposed to Pandora's atmosphere without any breathing equipment, they'd pass out in 20 seconds, and would be dead within 4 minutes. So, in order to move around on Pandora, they have to use a breather pack that lasts about 10 hours on one charge, or be piloting an aircraft known as the Scorpion, or use an amp suit. The amp suit is named after its purpose of being an amplifier, enlarging the human to become a 13 foot tall metal beast that can better do groundwork or patrol. But then of course, there's the avatar. However, the only people who can access an avatar is the people who share the same DNA with the body. Those people are called drivers, and the driver is able to control the avatar using a psionic link. So why go on and do it, as in make the avatars in the whole program? Well, the whole teaching loving part of the avatar program wasn't their main intention. The original purpose of the RDA funding the avatar program was to have the mine workers and security operate with them, making it so no one would have to wear the breathing masks, and no one would die due to the hazardous work conditions. But that would have ended up costing too much money. So they scrapped that idea and were like, hey, let's just let the workers get eaten. The Avatar program became focused on fixing relations with the indigenous population that were worsening at the time, mostly due to the unnecessary force of the Sky People, aka the hired guns of the RDA. Each Avatar was made to look like the natives to better establish trust. Prioritizing the scientists for using the Avatars was a way to better understand this foreign environment and a way to better understand the Navi. Grace's team was given the task of finding a diplomatic solution to the RDA mining an Obtanium on the Navi's land. In the year 2154, the main conflict between the humans and the Navi was caused by the largest deposit of Unobtanium being located right under Home Tree. Sometime in the past, Grace's team had established a school to help educate the Navi about the Sky People, teaching the Navi children how to understand English so they could have a closer relationship with said Sky People, as well as decrease the amount of miscommunications between the Omatikai settlement and the RDA settlement. Dr. Augustine had been working on relations with the Navi for around 30 years, and I'm assuming that the school was one of the first things she established, which would explain why Navi like Neytiri and Sute are able to speak English. But due to certain events, the Omatikai banished the humans and their avatars from their settlement. In this deleted scene at Grace's abandoned school for the Navi, Grace claims that the Navi felt as if they learned everything they needed to know about the humans. During this moment, Jake comes across bullet holes in the wall. He goes like, hey Grace, what, what happened over here? But Grace dismisses the question and just continues on, clearly being a sensitive subject for her. The event that left those bullet holes in that wall is why Grace's school was shut down and why the humans were banished from the settlement. When Jake was assigned to Grace's team as a security escort, Grace claims that the last thing she needed out there was another trigger-happy moron. Because the trigger-happy moron, working for the RDA, ended up killing Neytiri's sister. This is why Neytiri was immediately prepared to kill an avatar like Jake's when she first saw him on Pandora. Neytiri's sister was originally promised to Sute, and Sute constantly visited the Tree of Voices to communicate with her, which also explains the animosity that Sute held towards the humans, especially when they destroyed the Tree of Voices, which was the last connection that Neytiri had with her sister, and the last connection that Sute had with his dead lover. So it was really freaking personal for them. Even though Jake's avatar driving was supposed to go on for six years before he would have rotated back home, Jake Solly's journey with the Navi was only around roughly three months. When analyzing his video logs, you can see that he lived with the Omatikaya clan from May 19th, 2154 to August 24th, 2154. This mission was interrupted when Colonel Miles Quaritch, head of security for the RDA, essentially abused his approval status and basically put into effect his own version of martial law. Quaritch initially told Parker Selfridge, who was basically running the company RDA on Pandora at the time, that the removal operation would have minimal casualties. But when Selfridge saw the amount of explosives going out, specifically the daisy chains, he's like, oh, that was definitely a lie. Selfridge tried to stop the mission by threatening the colonel with punishment by those back on Earth. But Selfridge was reminded by the colonel that Earth was a long way from Pandora, and that he truly had no power at that moment. Can we just take literally an entire moment to talk about Dr. Max Patel? During the battle between the humans and the Navi, Dr. Max Patel led the Rogue One team who stayed inside the RDA settlement, as they helped prevent the humans from going scorched earth on the Navi. The Rogue One drivers accessed their avatars, and Dr. Patel stole one of those massive mining vehicles to destroy the control center, allowing the avatars to break through and cut off RDA's communication with the colonel's army. And Rogue One successfully took over the settlement. Rogue One's humans and avatars could be seen at the end of the film right here, as they were allowed 
to stay, but the rest of the humans were told to get the heck out. Okay, so that was my quick comprehensive guide to the Navi. When we get more information in the upcoming Avatar films, I would love to make a part two or three to this video, because honestly, and if I'm being if I'm being super duper honest, I would love to keep talking about Avatar in the future. Anyway, thanks for watching. Thank mm -hmm. you.